Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Diermeyer. I'm uh, the Dean of the Harris School. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our 25th anniversary celebration this afternoon. It is wonderful to see our alumni, our students, our faculty, our staff, and so many of our supporters from the university, the city, and beyond. We very much hope you will enjoy this afternoon of discussion, reflection, and celebration that we have planned for you. And uh, we'll get going in just a couple of minutes. Um, but I'd like to share a few thoughts uh, at this 25th anniversary of the school um, on how we're thinking about the school and where we want to take the school. Our school was founded on the belief that rigorous quantitative research is the best guide for public policies. Four decades ago, this conviction motivated the Committee on Public Policy Studies to advance the concept of a world-class policy program that would exhibit the University of Chicago traditions of intellectual rigor and interdisciplinary investigations. 25 years after the school, as we know it, opened its doors, Chicago Harris continues to build on this rich legacy. Honoring its foundation, the school does not restrict itself to any particular policy domain, but distinguishes itself by a unique point of view. From urban studies to early childhood development, from energy to global health and more, Harris brings an exacting, data-driven perspective to the full spectrum of policy concerns. Continually adapting to address the world's most complex social challenges, the school is a preeminent source of scholarship with immediate relevance to practitioners. Our students come to us with an ambition to make a difference, and they graduate with a set of skills that enable them to become effective policy leaders. Chicago Harris alumni are thriving in a wide range of fields, but they're all united by their commitment to figuring out what's best for society and getting it done. The marking of the school's 25th anniversary is a particularly exciting moment for me personally, in part because it coincides with my beginning of my tenure as dean. During my first few months here, a few things have become immediately apparent. We are blessed by an extraordinary, talented, and engaged community of students, faculty, alumni, and friends of the school they have worked tirelessly to create one of the world's leading policy schools. But now we find ourselves at a moment of great opportunity, characterized by tremendous momentum and alignment. Due to the extraordinary generosity of our supporters, we are able to finally realize our dream of a world-class home for a world-class school. We have a common ambition based on a common set of core beliefs that define our purpose and guide our decisions. And we have the energy and the commitment to make our, ambitions, our ambitious goals a reality. 25 years after our founding, we find ourselves at a pivotal moment for Chicago Harris. We are proud of what has been accomplished, but we're not satisfied. Rigor and relevance remain our compass, but our aspirations for the school continue to rise. As we embark on the next quarter of a century, we are poised to realize our ambition to become the world's greatest school of public policy and be recognized as such. A school whose graduates become leaders that put evidence first, a school whose faculty develop innovative policy solutions based on the best science of its day, and a school that sets the standard for what a policy school should be. I invite you to join me on this exciting and important journey and thank you for your support and commitment. Thank you. It is now my distinct pleasure to invite a very special member of our community to share a few thoughts with us on this special day. You all know Joan Harris. Many of you know her for her civic leadership and unparalleled contributions to the arts and for being a dedicated supporter of the Joan W. and Irving B. Harris Theater for Music and Dance. For her many contributions, she received the 2013 National Medal of the Arts from President Obama. But today we welcome Joan as a tireless supporter of Chicago Harris, whose extraordinary generosity over many years through the Irving Harris Foundation and personally has spurred additional philanthropy to the school and allow us to be where we are right now and to take the next step in our development. For us, she is the link to Irving's legacy 
and a good friend. Please join me in welcoming Joan Harris. I get to be the informal uh, institutional memory person. Um, yes, I was there at the beginning, but I was there on the sidelines uh, watching, watching my wonderful husband, Irving, uh, come to the conclusion that the Harris School had to become a real place. Just for a moment, I want to pay special tribute to Hannah Gray, who's not here tonight or this afternoon. Hannah, it was on her watch that there was a birthing from the, the uh, Committee on Public Policy to the school. And uh, Hannah had taken a look at what was happening and she thought either we have to make a big leap forward and make this into a real school or we have to close up shop. And as it happened many, many times when Irving was sitting in a room and he heard a felt need, he felt the answer. And it was at that moment that he came forward and said that he would make the initial contribution that created the school. And that's really how the committee on public policy uh, transmogrified was changed. <laughs> You know what I mean, to, uh, to, the, to the school. Um, what was in Irving's mind? He had several things that he thought could be accomplished by creating a, a great school. He knew from his work with young people who were interested in public policy that there were many many young people out there, and many of you are sitting here in the audience today, brilliant, dedicated, devoted, who just didn't want to take that path to medical school or law school. There had to be another way for young people who really cared to enter the world of public life. And that was really what he had in mind. The other piece of it was where should it be? And of course, the answer was the University of Chicago, which has the intellectual heft and the power to be home for such a school. And over the years, I've watched students come and graduate, faculty dig in, deans come and go, and I think all of that is, um, has come as the dream has come true, and I'm very proud to be here, uh, not because I've done anything, but because I'm here to keep Irving's memory alive, so that we all, those of you who knew him can remember, and those of you who didn't can know that there was a really, really smart guy who was uh, at, the, at the point where things could happen. I know many of you have looked at the um, portrait of Irving that's in the lobby of the old school. I hope that portrait will move over to the new school. But if you see it, it's a double portrait. And that was no accident. When Victor Skrebneski, the great photographer, photographed Irving, he told me later he saw, he saw two Irvings. He saw somebody with the mind and somebody with the heart. So that really tells me everything. I'm always very pleased and very proud to see that photograph of him. I'm happy to be here today to share all this with all of you. And I thank the Dean for inviting me. And it's gonna be a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, Joan. Um, our first event, our kickoff event uh, for this day, uh, we'll take a look back at the first 25 years of Chicago Harris as a graduate school. Uh, the discussion will aptly be led by two of our distinguished former deans, uh, Bob Michael and Susan Mayer. 
who will reflect on the origins and then the development of the school throughout the years. Uh, Bob Michael is the, I hope I say this right, the Eliakim, Eliakim? Eliakim Hastings Moore Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus at Chicago Harris. He was the founding dean of Chicago Harris and has for many years uh, had a distinguished uh, career as a researcher, as, as a teacher. Uh, he also has been uh, linked with um, NRC, uh, which is, of course, uh, right, located right next to and has close connection with the Harris School and served as the CEO of NRC as well. Uh, Michael's current research, Bob Michael's current research focuses on parental investments in children and on adolescent and adult sexual behavior in the United States. Susan Mayer, Professor at Chicago Harris and the college served as dean of the Harris School from 2002 to 2009. She has published numerous articles and book chapters on the measurement of poverty, the effect of growing up in poor neighborhoods, and the effect on parental income on children's well-being. She's currently doing research on intergenerational economic mobility and on using behavioral insights to help low-income adults become better parents. Please join me in welcoming Bob Michael and Susan Mayer. Susan and I join the Dean in welcoming you to this celebration of the first 25 years of the Harris School. The Dean has asked Susan and me to lead off this afternoon with a little bit about the history and the life and the folks of the Harris School. Seems appropriate we do so. Susan was the first person hired by the Harris School, came fresh from Northwestern the first year the school got underway as an assistant professor served in the school. She's been dean, as uh, Dean Dannemeyer said, for eight years here in the Harris School. She now runs an important lab in the Harris School and is uh, the longest serving, continually involved faculty member of the Harris School. So she's here to tell you about the life of the school. I was uh, a member of the faculty committee that urged the creation of the school. We'll tell you about that in a little bit. Uh, a member of the founding faculty of the school and the first dean of the school. So between us, we have a good bit of experience in history. And we're going to go back and forth talking to you this hour. Uh, and as you might expect for a birthday party, we're going to have slides. We're going to have pictures of the infant and the toddler. And you, you get the, what we'll be doing here. Uh, before Susan starts with those slides, I have one point I want to make. And that is that starting a school at a major research university like the University of Chicago is a big deal. There were five professional schools at the university when we got underway. The Divinity School was founded in 1865. It was founded as the Chicago Baptist Institute, and that's long before there was a University of Chicago. It joined the University of Chicago in 1892 when the university got started. The Business School was founded in 1898, the Law School in 1902, SSA, the School of Social Service Administration in 1920, and the Medical School in 1927. So then you jump 60 years to 1987, Harris School. It had been 60 years since the University of Chicago had started a professional school. That implies there was no one on the faculty, no one in the administration, no one at the university, though perhaps a student or two, that had been around when the last time this university started a professional school. So it was a big deal. It wasn't routine. It wasn't inevitable. It had some controversy associated with it. But now I'm starting into the history. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to turn the podium over to Susan. And she's going to get us underway talking about, well, some of the vital statistics of this 25-year uh, history and a little bit of trends. And then I'll come back and talk about some history. Then she'll talk about some life of the school. Susan. Well, I can go through this pretty fast because you'll see that um, all the graphs look sort of the same. But we didn't think we could. Um, talk about the history of the school, it being the Harris School, without graphs and charts. So let, we'll begin with that. Um, this is the school by the numbers. This is the number of new um, master's level students at the Harris School beginning in 1989 into um, the current year. Um, a little bit of ups and downs, but basically that trend is up. 
Um, this is the headcount of the faculty, the number of people with voting rights on our faculty. A few bumps, but that trend is upward. This is full-time equivalent faculty, a different way of looking at the, at the number of faculty. Upward, up to about 30 now. This is a list that Bob compiled of all the faculty who've ever been associated with the Hare School. Um, that would be 72 people. Um, you can see there in the beginning, those with the FF, those were the founding faculty members. A very distinguished group, an extremely distinguished group. Very intimidating group to join as a junior faculty member, I might add. Um, more on that later. Um, the little arrows mean when people left. So you can see in the beginning, people left, people came. But now, since I think 2010, no one's left our faculty. This is just entertainment purposes. For those of you who may have known some of these people, and you can see I have no shame. I'm included in that group. Um, more entertainment. This is moving through the faculty. Um, people we, may, we, we remember um, who've departed, and some of those who are still here and have fortunately matured a little bit. Uh, and this is our current faculty, uh, minus Daniel, whose uh, picture will appear later. Um, it's a distinguished group of um, 34, 35 with Daniel uh, faculty members. Um, this is the growth in the school's finances. Um, again, if we had put this on a chart, you'd see everything going up. Um, you might not be so happy to see the tuition going up. Um, it tripled in nominal terms, but uh, didn't even quite double in um, um, price adjusted terms. I didn't ask Bob which price adjustment he used. We could have debated that. Um, it might not be 1.8, but it's something close. Um, the budget of the school went from practically nothing to um, almost 22 million, and the endowment too has risen. Um, a lot of that money feeds back into um, financial aid to offset some of the rise in tuition. The Harris School has graduated 2,708 master's students. That's 2,708 people out there making the world a better place. Um, 135 PhD students mostly studying how to make the world a better place. Uh, but that's a huge contribution um, to the school. Um, and with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Bob. Um, to give us the history. The schools had a, a steady, impressive run in its first 25 years. They were in good shape and were primed for greatness under our new leader. That we need to celebrate too, but for the next while, I want to take you back to the beginning, talk about some history, and then talk about some of the hallmarks, the issues that were around as the school got underway. And then having talked about the life of the, uh, the, life of the mind, Susan is going to come back and talk about the life of the school, the people, the fun part of all this. So bear with me. It, it, you know, this is, after all, the Harris School, the University of Chicago, you've got to have a little... Uh, content here. So let's, I'm going to spend a few minutes on the 1970s, then a little bit on the 1980s as the school got underway, and then some of the hallmarks of the new school. I chose to start with 1972. The Ford Foundation, within the foundation, created a Committee on Public Policy and Social Organization in, 90, or in 72, and then funded eight uh, graduate level institutions in public policy programs. These were not necessarily the very first, 
as I understand it, the first school that had public policy was Michigan in 1914. Syracuse in 1924 got its program underway, Princeton in 1930. Uh, Harvard had a program started in 1937, later called the Kennedy School. Uh, so these, were not, these eight were not necessarily the first, but the, the uh, thing the Ford Foundation gets credit for is thinking that if you're going to have a profession and you're going to have a career in this area, you can't do that with one or two isolated schools. You have to have several. So they initiated this program in the early 70s, funded these eight, uh, seven of which have continued to the, uh, today. And the context here, remember, uh, 1964 was the time President Johnson had started the war on poverty, the uh, OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity. 1964 was also the year in which Gary Becker's book on human capital was published that uh, showed that the rate of return to investing in college was about 15%. It was a time of great optimism about the role, the, uh, the potential effectiveness of public policy to enhance well-being. Okay, so then the Ford Foundation comes along, starts these schools, and gets this underway. It's about that same time that at the University of Chicago, a committee of six deans reported uh, and proposed to President Levy the creation of a committee of public policy studies at Chicago. We were not part of that Ford group. This is a quote from uh, that committee's report, statement calling for multidisciplinary training, mastering new types of intellectual skills. And this reflected the core value of the University of Chicago, a reliance on scientific knowledge and intellectual skills to address problems and advance well-being. So soon after that committee, the school got underway, or I'm sorry, the committee on public policy studies got underway. Here's the faculty of it. I'm not going to go through all that, of course, though I do want to point out uh, that most of the faculty, some 16 of the two dozen faculty, were from professional schools, from the law school, from SSA, business school, a few others. Only five social scientists there, one each from five departments. Okay. I thought that was kind of a little uh, interesting. But, uh, there's one each from those departments. And uh, Steve Berry in chemistry and Bill Kreskel from the division of the physical sciences as well. The school then ran for about 10 years, had a master's degree it gave near the end, a PhD program. It only hired a few non-tenured faculty most of the faculty came from uh, the rest of the university with tenure, came to the school, taught, and went back. So it was a fairly large faculty, but it was uh, somewhat amorphous. Okay? After the 10 years, as John mentioned before, in 85, 86, 87, a decision was to be made about what to do with this committee. It was never intended that the Committee of Public Policy Studies would stand uh, in the long term. It was to be tried and then something would happen. One argument was you'd put it into one of the uh, uh, professional schools, build it into SSA or build it into the business school or perhaps into the social sciences, but to do something with it. Wisely, I think that thought went away very quickly and the choice really became by 1986, either to shut it down or elevate it to full school status. So that was the issue when in 86, there were these four groups that participated in advising the president of the university, Hannah Gray, about what to do. I'll go through these rather quickly here and then a little detail. One of those was a committee of five deans that uh, Hannah put together to advise her. The uh, vote on that committee was three to two, so it wasn't overwhelmingly endorsed. I'll explain that in a minute. Then there was a, f a committee of the faculty of the Committee of Public Policy Studies. They strongly endorsed creating a school. And you might think that was self-serving or self-protective, but it was not because the, most everybody on that committee was tenured in another home. So if the committee went away, they wouldn't lose their job. So the fact that they favored it, having been in it for 10 years, was a powerful statement of its efficacy and potential. Then there was this most interesting of committees, the uh, Bidwell Committee, it became called. It was an ad hoc group of faculty, I was a part of that, that got together and decided to give Hannah our 
suggestion about what to do with the committee because we like the students, we like the concept of the committee. We weren't a part of the Committee on Public Policy Studies, but we advocated in behalf of uh, the uh, creation of the school. And then, of course, the fourth and pivotal organization that played a role in advising Hannah was the Board of Trustees, and there's where Irving's uh, leadership and contribution was so pivotal at some point that you'll see in a minute. That um, committee of deans, these five deans, the first two, the law school dean and the business school dean, Garrett Casper and Jack Gould, and then three divisional deans. And the, it was the two uh, deans of professional schools that voted against creating the school. They, like the other three, uh, admired the intellectual activity within the program. They admired the students and their resourcefulness and energy. They thought bringing the various areas together was compelling and worthy, but they doubted the business model. They doubted that there'd be funds for a school, and they were the two deans in that five that had to run their own uh, financial outfit. The other three were part of the whole university, those deans in professional schools knew how hard it was to make a school go, and so they doubted it on the business side, not on any other side. Okay? This is a letter the Bidwell Committee sent to the president of the university advocating in behalf of uh, the school. You can't read those, but you see all those signatures down there. This is the set of folks that signed that letter. You'll see there that six were from professional schools, but eight were from the social sciences. And Steve Berry, the fellow that had been on one of those earlier committees, the chemist, was then, is today, a major contributor and uh, supporter of the Harris School. Um, this is the committee, and my favorite quote of all the quotes we're going to show you today was in this letter from Charles Bidwell and company. We believe that uh, intellectual engagement with concrete problems of human life invigorate scholarship and enhance the originality and significance of research. It is intellectual engagement with concrete problems of human life. It's what research ought to be and that'll make research better. Okay. And then also we advocate a strong research-oriented curriculum in public policy studies. So this was what the rest of the faculty was saying to Hannah Gray. So all four groups uh, reported in and Hannah was the president as Joan pointed out before that was charged with making the decision what to do with the committee. She uh, advocated on behalf of the school, the uh, Senate of the, the academic Senate of the faculty voted for it. It went to the Board of Trustees and it was with Irving's support at that point in part because of the concern that Jack Gould and Gerhard Casper had had as these deans that were advising the president were not sure about the business model, that Irving's contribution was so pivotal in Hannah's decision to make a go of this, okay? So Irving is our hero at that point in, in, in a way that is really hard to, uh, you, you can't overstate it, it's hard to understand how pivotal that was that the Board of Trustees, the folks from Chicago, not the university faculty, okay, folks downtown, they said this could be and they were, Irving was willing to put his money there to show that it was in fact a viable organization. Uh, very soon thereafter, a faculty was appointed, I'll show you who they were, uh, an 11 member uh, faculty. In 88, 89, Bill Kreskel served as Dean Pro Tem of the school while we were sorting things out. He'd been Dean for 10 years in the social sciences and was an eminently qualified man to run that school that year. By June 89, it was announced that I would be the Dean starting in the fall and about a year after that, the school was named the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies and we were underway. The founding faculty are the same ones that you saw in the slide that Susan had before. And then in that interim year, uh, Bob Chirinko, who was a, a young economist in the committee, became a part of the school. Susan got hired from Northwestern as a sociologist. Bob was an economist. Joe Hotz was brought in uh, as an economist at that point. And uh, Howard Margoli is a political scientist. So all four of them, as well as most of the, this faculty, were social scientists as we got underway. Thus. School got a name. School got its first uh, chaired professorship, the Ameritech chair, 
We're very proud of that. That's a corporate chair that was the first chair that came to the Harris School. And I remember the meeting in which they, the folks at Ameritech were thinking about that and talking about it. And the thing that I think that got them to commit to this rather than some other worthy enterprise was the fact that every student at the Harris School had to know some calculus. They looked around at each other at the Ameritech. This is not a school that it takes things lightly and is fluffy. You know, this is serious stuff. So they could get behind that. So we got that chair. Uh, Don Corsi was honored, given that chair, and continues to serve as the chaired professor in that area. Uh, lots of centers and research units and labs were set up, one being here in the uh, health research with Christine Castle. And then a few years later, the Human Potential and Public Policy, the Center for Human Potential and Public Policy that Joan and Irving funded as a center. So we got underway. The school was underway. And in some way, there's our history. Now what I want to do for the next few minutes is talk a little bit more about some content. Uh, not, not the events, but the, the ideas behind this. First of these, I want to take a few minutes on this because it emphasizes that it was not automatic, that we are, that we became what we are, or that it was just kind of rolled out. It was a major debate, concern, about whether we should be a school of policy analysis or a school of public management. Okay. Those that thought public management was where the action should be argued that policies are easy enough to identify, but implementing them is where the problems lie and where the successes are. So what we needed was a school that taught how to implement the policy, how to make the policy work, how to manage the teams that put the policy in action. And the group that argued in behalf of that uh, point of view were a formidable group. It included Sidney Stein, Jr. Uh, Jim Stein had been the man that had funded the committee in the mid-'80s. Jim Stein was uh, chairman of the visiting committee first time for the committee. Jim Stein was on the board of trustees of the university, financial manager well-known uh, in Chicago, Steinro and Farnham. His brother-in-law, Ferd Kramer, was another of those. He was on the visiting committee. He was on the board of trustees. Uh, a, another pivotal Chicago figure, a developer, Draper and Kramer. The third of those, or four of these, was a man named uh, Elmer Statz. Elmer Statz was the Comptroller General of the United States, the head of GAO. Elmer Statz was a legend in Washington, a man of stature and integrity, and he was on our visiting committee. And a fourth was rather unknown, not not much known around the University of Chicago, a man named Don Stone. Don was Dean of Gaspia, the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at Pittsburgh. But Don Stone was a formidable intellect and a formidable, powerful individual who had great influence on these others. He had helped write the Charter of the United Nations. He had been an implementer of the Marshall Plan. He was a powerful man, an older man by the time we were getting underway. And Don Stone had great influence on Elmer Statz and Ferd Kramer and uh, Jim Stein. And I was asked, told when I became dean, go talk to each of those four. They powerfully pushed for a school of public management. Okay? And that, that was one option. The other option, of course, was a school of analysis, uh, one that would rely on uh, tools of social science, economics, so, uh, political science, sociology, statistics, and advance choosing the policy, not implementing the policy. And the faculty, for the most part, favored that model. So as we were starting a school, we had these two very different models with a powerful force on each side. The University of Chicago, that was not a difficult choice to make. The motto of the university is Crescat Scientia, Vita Escalator, let knowledge grow from more to more, and so be human life enriched. A bedrock conviction of the University of Chicago is that science and advances in knowledge can enrich mankind Evidence should be the basis of judgment. Ideas matter. Now, the enrichment of life based on knowledge isn't automatic. It takes policy. And that's where the policy school came in. And the choice that was made to go with analysis, not with public management, was surely the right choice. It was the only right choice for our university. That's the culture of the University of Chicago the power of ideas, life of the mind, rigorous pursuit of knowledge. Nevertheless, we had these folks that were very influential in the creation of the school that we somehow needed to bring along. 
those that advocated the other program. There were three forces that we had there that really helped. One of them was the culture of the university, and both Jim Stein and Ferd Kramer were on the board. They understood it as well as Irving did. That was the life. The life of the mind was what this university was about. We, that was the right place for our school, and they came around reasonably uh, uh, quickly. Another was that we had a group of social scientists on that faculty that were really eminent. That was a group of people that might well be able to divine a curriculum that could influence public policy for years to come. Okay? And finally, we had an asset that was uh, kind of additional in that. It was one of the faculty members, Larry Lynn. Larry Lynn had run the public management program at Harvard before he, had come, before he came to Chicago to be dean of the School of Social Service Administration, and he was on the faculty. One of those four, when I went to have those interviews when I became dean, told me that Larry Lynn was the guy that had created the legislation that had broken up HEW and created Health and Human Services in the Department of Education, and he was probably the only man in Washington that really understood how that partitioning came to be. Larry Lynn was their hero. And Larry Lynn was on our faculty. And Larry Lynn knew the culture of the University of Chicago. And he, like all the rest of us, thought it had to be analysis. It couldn't be public management at the University of Chicago. The fact that it worked, that is, that we were persuasive in convincing that group of four, is twofold. First, Elmer Statz, this man in Washington that was the Comptroller General, when he stepped down, urged Charles Boucher, the new Comptroller General, to join our board. And Chuck Boucher served on our board the entire time he was head of GAO. And when he stepped down, he helped us recruit David Walker, the next Comptroller General. So we're the only policy school in the world that has had three successive Comptrollers General of the United States on our board of visitors, on the visiting committee that guided the school. So clearly, Elmer came around in 1994, delighted that we acquired the Sidney Stein Jr. Chaired Professorship. Jim Stein came around as well and committed to this program, and he and his family uh, endowed a chaired professorship that Larry Lynn uh, held in the first few years after that uh, Will Howell now holds that chair. In addition, we always had organization theory, Larry Lynn's area, as one of the core programs, and he taught it for a while. He and Susan taught it jointly for a while. That's been a part of our core ever since. Okay, so moving defining the substance of the training. The Committee of Public Policy Studies had, had this fine group of faculty from around the university that came and taught a course and went home. It didn't have a core. It didn't have a, 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 a basic connectedness to it, okay? It, it was befit a new unit, a, a new committee, but that was also true in the nation. Of those several schools, there was no consensus about what the curriculum was that was what a public policy professional would know or do. And the first time I went to the Board of Trustees as the new dean to talk, I pointed out that, quote, we as a faculty take as our challenge to help define what a public policy professional is and what a public policy professional can do. And we intended to do that, of course, not just for our school, but for public policy professionals and the career at large. We set out to do that because we had a, a remarkably good faculty. Jim Coleman, I think one of the premier social scientists of the 20th century. Bill Wilson, Charles Bidwell, these were the sociologists who were uh, guiding us. Uh, Russell Hardin and Duncan Snydell were the political scientists. Jim Heckman in economics. Uh, Larry Lynn in organizational theory. Christine Castle in medicine. It was a superb faculty. They could do that. We also had 10 years exploring the committee. And unlike the schools that got started as a school, we started as a committee, waited 10 years, decided what to do, and could revamp. The group of us that were organizing the school were not those from the committee. So we could take what was good, drop what wasn't, and create at that point what we thought was right. We also had this U of C bedrock conviction about that science should guide us, let knowledge grow from more to more. And we had an old U of C uh, confidence, some might say arrogance, that we could figure out what was right and then help the rest of the world understand it as well. So we had that going for us as well. <laughs> My point is not that we were right, though I think we were, and I think within our university it was definitely right, and we did have influence on the rest of the profession. But my point is that we had an aspiration that was very elevated. 
we began this school with that elevation, elevated aspiration that we wanted to set the standard, not just for our school, but for the profession of public policy. Training and research, the core is science. And if you're a first year student, you'll recognize that the program we began with in the late 80s is pretty much like the program you run into today. A couple of courses in economics and statistics, a couple of courses in political theory, uh, social organization on a capstone, pull it together kind of course, just like our school. Um, areas of concentration that the second year, you, you focus on some substantive area so you get an expertise in a domain, and then you pick up some tools of the trade and accounting and budgeting, program evaluation, survey, research, communication skills, and the like. That's what that curriculum was all about. What should the hallmarks be? What, what should the school be? We wanted a consistent message for the school, one that was shared by students and faculty, staff, visiting committee, university administrators, employers, prospective students, the world. Had to be research-based, had to have technically strong core curriculum like the one I just showed you. One thing we had in order to achieve that was concentrations. That second year of the program, faculty organized themselves into these areas that worked in substantive domains, child policy, education, health, urban inequality, those were the social programs in the non-social programs, the international policy, regulatory, aggregate policy, political economy, social choice, ethics, rationality, some changes in those over time as the faculty has changed from one to another, but a, a, a substantive core focus on these areas. There were also a number of centers. Uh, Bill Wilson had a center on urban inequality. Larry Lynn and his colleague, uh, Larry Joseph, had this uh, urban research and policy studies put on conferences downtown every year with about two or 300 people, put out a book every year on public management in, in the city of Chicago. Jim Heckman ran the uh, program evaluation uh, center at the time, a center for health policy that Chris Castle ran, later uh, David Meltzer has had the Joint Center for Poverty Research that Susan and I were involved in was a health and human service funded five, six year uh, core poverty center for the United States that we did jointly. The joint there means joint with Northwestern University. The Center for Human Potential and Public Policy that Irving and Joan funded. And that was the only center that has core endowment that uh, allows it to do things over the long haul that the other center don't like our poverty center that was there funded for five or six years and when HHS moved its funding, that center closed up. The, our human potential and public policy center need never do that and has a much longer horizon because of it. The culture policy center was yet another of those centers started quite early on. Then jumping ahead, there were a whole bunch of other centers that uh, are active today. Uh, this is not all of them, of course, but uh, it shows that the organization of the research was vitally integrated with the training program at the Harris School. The early year expressions of what the school was about. We talked about problem-driven inquiry. That reminds one back of the comment of the Bidwell Committee, intellectual engagement with concrete problems of human life, the problem-driven. Tools of analysis, you know what they are, that's the core of our program. Empirical uh, epistemology, evidence-based judgment, and multidisciplinary. Can't tell you how many times I said as dean, no discipline has a monopoly on insights about real problems. It takes a little sociology, a little political science, a little history, a little economics, a lot of different areas if you're gonna focus on the problem instead of the tool. Bringing basic research to the classroom, using research to guide policy. Collaborative, within the university, we were never to be isolated. We weren't a school that wanted to stand apart, we wanted to be a part of. And likewise, we wanted to be a part of what was going on downtown, to be a part of the civic uh, activities within the city and within the nation. The essence of the school's approach to training and research is analysis, bringing data and other information to bear in a systematic manner on debate and decision making. Thus, the life of the mind. Now, the life of uh, the school, the people, and Susan. So, I want to thank Bob for giving us the history of the school. Um, 25 years ago, I uh, came as an untenured assistant professor to a school with 
uh, no history and a future that had to be made out of whole cloth. In addition, uh, this new school had this interdisciplinary faculty that Bob alluded to. Um, that meant that there was no precedent and no reasonable way to strategize about how to get tenure in that environment. And when I looked around at the faculty, those founding faculty members, um, I thought that what it meant to be a member of an interdisciplinary faculty was that your research was so profound and so influential and so innovative that it was known and respected across all the disciplines. That was a tall order and one I really couldn't imagine um, um, ever achieving, so I decided that I, my strategy had to be just to work as hard as I could um, on the things I thought was important so that when I didn't get tenure, um, at least I wouldn't have regrets. Um, that meant that I frankly know nothing about what was going on in the school for those first years. All I did was my research. So a lot of this is new to me even though I was there. Um, and I couldn't, have, I couldn't have told that story. So what I'll talk about instead is the complement to the life of the mind and that's the life of the school because after all the Harris School is a professional school. Um, it's not a department and so its job is not only to teach the tools that people need to become good, good policy analysts, good policy makers, um, good um, um, uh, advocates, and all the things our students become, but they also need the professional tools to do that. Um, so I'm going to po focus on the life of the school. Um, and I'm really happy to have this uh, opportunity to focus on the history of the school, and especially these aspects, because it was always very frustrating to me when I was dean that everyone, um, students, alums, university administrators, the advisory boards, all seemed to focus on what hadn't been accomplished and not what had been accomplished. And I too shared that urgency to be in the future. That, after all, is what makes us progress. We all want to be in the future and we don't want to spend that much time thinking about the past. Uh, but sometimes um, it's, um, it's important to appreciate the past and that um, is something one notices as one becomes part of the past, I might add. <laughs> so, um, so it's nice to talk about it. Um, and I'll talk about three related things. Uh, moving beyond the classroom, this the things we do that make our students professionals, um, symbols of the growing reputation and influence of the school, and um, a little bit of gratitude to the school's history makers. Um, and I'm gonna start with um, practicums. And I'll start with the international policy practicum. Charlie Wieland, who many of you in this room may know, uh, came to me, it must have been, I don't know what it was, 2003 or four, or something like that. Um, and asked to put together a program in which 10 or 12 students would study an issue in a country for a 10-week quarter, and then they'd get on an airplane, instead of taking a final, fly to that country, learn about that, come back, write a white paper, and give that paper to representatives of that country. That was an ambitious idea. Other schools had done similar things, and I had the good sense to let Charlie do uh, what was a very good idea, and I think it's been, I don't know, maybe we've had 10, ten of these. Um, um, there's Charlie up there at the top, Alicia Menendez now is the faculty facilitator. Um, they've been all over, and I'm happy to say that on Saturday I'm going to Chile to be with the um, International IPP this year, um, something I've wanted to do ever since it was started, but didn't do it, um, or didn't have the opportunity until now. Um, we've always had policy practicums in a sort of ad hoc way at the school. This is where students sort of work on a real life problem with a faculty member. And we had these in a very ad hoc way until Paula Worthington, who was pictured here, came to the school. And now we do these in a very um, sort of organized way. And every year um, we have four or five practicums. They've uh, ranged um, in topics, cost-benefit analysis of extending the Affordable Care Act, a project on um, 
parking and parking meters with the Metropolitan Planning Council. Uh, one practicant developed a scorecard with Groupon to use to measure its corporate citizenship, and on and on and on. Um, the urban revitalization project in Gary, um, initiated by former Mayor Richard Daly, is another important addition to this. All these are ways we professionalize our students and um, get them out there, um, putting, their, putting their tools to work. Um, but the signature program, and one started by Irving, is the mentor program. Um, um, the, um, we have about 100 mentors who um, are paired up with students, and I, I've always sort of loved the mentor program. It doesn't always work like any matching process. It sometimes fails miserably, um, sometimes because of the student, sometimes because of the mentor, sometimes just because of bad timing, uh, but sometimes it works brilliantly. And when I was dean, I was always amazed at the number of students who would come back to me and say something like, well, I wasn't that crazy about econometrics, or even I was crazy about econometrics, but what I really remember is the experience I had with Paula Wolf or Bud um, Lifton or um, Bob Malott or Valerie Jarrett, who was a great mentor at the time. Um, those, those experiences of uh, working with someone who could tell you the ropes really made a big difference um, to our students. And here's just a small set of some of the 100 mentors. Um, and you, if you look among there, you will see alums of the school, you'll see members of the visiting committee, you'll see people from uh, leaders in, in the private, the public, and the nonprofit sector. It's really, really just an amazing group of people. Um, and the mentor dinner is one of the more important events of the school each year, where our mentors are paired with their mentees. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the um, speakers, too, um, which is a little weird. Um, why speakers? Why is that of interest? Well, I just want to note that we have one, um, one endowed speaker uh, or one, one endowed um, lecture um, each year. Um, and the, the speakers that come through the school um, are important to our students. They share their experiences. They, um, um, I'll put that there. They inspire our students. They um, give pointers to our students. They're very important. But that's not why I'm talking about them now. I'm talking about them because of the symbolism of having speakers of the stature of these people come to the school. Because I can remember when it was impossible for us to beg someone to come speak at the school. When the first phone call, we'd have to explain what the Harris School was. Usually that would involve explaining what a policy school was. Then there'd be the question of how much they might charge. And then there would be the question of, would there be anybody influential in the audience? Uh, because speakers don't just come out of the goodness of their heart. <laughs> they usually have multiple motiv motivations. So the fact that we're able to attract people of this stature um, just tells me that um, we've, we've been able to achieve the networks, the influence, and the stature to make these people want to come and talk to our students. So I think that's pretty great. Um, next thing I want to talk about is um, student organizations. They're great. They rock. Um, does anybody here remember Thirsty Thursdays? <laughs> Nobody's admitting it. But I know that somebody out there remembers Thirsty Thursdays. So Thirsty Thursdays um, were the main thing that, that um, PPSA, the student, student uh, um, association at the school did in the very olden days. Basically, they set up a bar in the back hall of the school and had a party, which is great. I'm all for bonding and I'm all for social, social events and so on. But um, as the schools matured, so had the student organizations. Um, and we now have, um, I think, 18 important student organizations doing amazing things for the school. Um, 
This is the list of them. Some of them are on specific policy topics. Some of them support students with um, a, um, different kinds of student um, student initiatives, um, and they're all they're all great. Um, they do networking. They provide resources, information, all these wonderful things. But again, that's not why I'm talking about them. Um, student organizations do provide a lot of benefits, but it's their symbolism that I think is most relevant for the history of the school. Uh, because they're indicators that students are engaged, and they're engaged in all the things on that list. Um, there's research that suggests that college students are more likely to form and join student organizations when they're optimistic about their future. So the growth of these student organizations suggests to me an increase in student commitment and optimism that comes at least in part from a growing belief in the efficacy of the training that they're getting. I might also say that the research also shows that student organizations are, um, provide students with important sort of non-cognitive skills that are good in the labor market, and I could give a different lecture on that, but I won't. Um, so speakers, student organizations um, are symbolic of the school's maturity. Um, those, along with the practicums and mentoring, provide the qualitative yin to the rigorous quantitative yang of the classroom experience. Um, and that's important in a professional school. Um, so now before going on, I want to talk a little bit more about um, a set of experiments. Again, because it's the University of Chicago. So no history would be complete without a little bit of research. Um, and what I want to describe is um, an experiment in which subjects were randomly assigned to three different groups. Um, all three groups were asked to keep a journal. Group one was asked to briefly describe at the end of each week five things about which they were grateful. The second group was asked to describe in their journal five things that had displeased them or irritated them over the last week. The third group was asked to write down whatever they wanted, five things, whatever they wanted to reflect on. Um, at the end of 10 weeks, participants in the gratitude group um, felt better about their lives as a whole, were 25% happier than the group that wrote down things they didn't like. They reported fewer health complaints, and they exercised for an hour and a half longer than the other group. <laughs> Extrapolating from that in a way that, by the way, my faculty colleagues might find irritating. <laughs> Let's just say gratitude makes you happier and healthier. OK, but yet there is more. Um, a follow-on study, subjects were asked to write down um, every day things about which they were grateful. The people who wrote down something every day were yet more happy and yet more healthy and exercised yet more than the ones who did it only once a week. But there is still more because the people, friends and family close to those people who wrote down the things that they were grateful about reported that that person was more what we call pro-social, more emotionally supportive, more friendly, in better moods, and so on. So gratitude makes you happier and healthier, and it makes the people around you happier as well. So, this is a great opportunity for us to um, look back over the years, think about the things and the people for whom we're grateful, and fill up our grateful journal to make ourselves happier. And so that's what I want to do. Oops, sorry. Um, and I want to start with the visiting committee. Um, all divisions in the school and schools at the university have an advisory board, which is called the visiting committee. Um, members of the Harris School Visiting Committee are some of the most distinguished and accomplished people you might ever meet. Most of you in this room, um, if you're not a member of the visiting committee, probably um, won't ever know how much uh, they do for the school because they tend to work in the background. 
but I can tell you from experience, my experience as dean, that they are among the most important resources for the Harris School. Um, they're not only an exceptional sounding board when they're called upon for that, they volunteer as mentors, they provide valuable funds for the school, um, they just will do it all if you ask them to. And these are the chairman of the visiting committees um, over the year. Um, they made history. Each of them contributed to the history of the school. They're our history makers. Um, and we're grateful. They go in our grateful journal. Next, the Dean's International Council. So globalization in most industries had pretty much taken hold by the early 2000s. In a globalized world, few policies, um, policy issues are entirely domestic. Health, education, security, energy, kind of you go down the list, all these are increasingly global issues. And the policies needed to address them um, are um, increasingly require international cooperation. Even, even policies that seem uh, primarily to be like a domestic problem, something like poverty, um, new ideas are emerging in other countries around the world that would be useful for the US. So in, I can't actually remember if it was 2004, 2005, maybe it was 2003, whatever year it was, um, we had the idea of drawing together a group of distinguished leaders from around the world that would advise the school on global issues. Um, and that group, I should say, was largely made up of people who had never heard of the Harris School and many who had never heard of the University of Chicago. Yet they came together um, to form this group um, called the Dean's International Council. Um, it brought great international credibility and visibility to the school. It raised funds, um, helped us um, with the, especially with the initial um, international policy practicums and other things. Um, and members of the Dean's International Council are also our history makers, and we're grateful for them. And I also should say, they're, this is fun. <laughs> the Dean's International Council was one of the fun things. Um, because you go to places, you know, you ride around in tuk-tuks in India with your friends. You put on those, whatever those scarves were. I wasn't at that, but it looks like it was fun. Um, and so, um, uh, sometimes it's good to have fun. Uh, this would be a good time also to mention that the schools um, increased its international partnerships. This is also symbolic of the growing influence um, and um, um, respectability of the school. I think we now have probably eight international partnerships. I think Bob started the first one with um, um, Ibero-Americana University in Mexico with some of our alums. Uh, we added Chile and now we have um, um, partnerships with Yonsei uh, University in South Korea, Tel Aviv University in Israel, um, many others um, as well that, that Com um, helped to organize. Um, so um, this group helps in that respect as well. Staff, they are our history. If it's true that a scientist who makes a discovery is standing on the shoulders of a giant, it's equally true that a successful organization rests on the shoulders of its employees. For the last 25 years, the staff has um, kept our computers working, mostly, usually. Uh, they've um, uh, kept the facilities as good as they could be. No small task, I might add. Um, they've kept the budget balanced. They've recruited our students, kept track of their progress, counseled them, set an example for them. And for many of our staff, past and present, their commitment went well beyond that of an employee. Um, I think it was actually King Harris who told me this. Forgive me if, if I have that wrong, King. Um, he once said to me, I believe it was him, you can love an institution, but don't expect it to love you back. Um, prophetic words, I might add. Uh, but um, all the more reason we should take a moment um, and acknowledge that these are history makers for the school too, and that we're grateful. Past and present, not everybody's there. Next, 
alums who give back, both financially and otherwise. Our alums sit on our visiting committee, uh, they give talks at the school, they help us recruit our students. Um, not only that, they're the core product of the school. Um, our success is literally measured by their success. And by that measure, we rock, because they rock. Um, seriously, they really do some amazing things. Um, I, can't, I can't list them now, but they really are amazing. Um, and our alums are in a unique position. When many alums return to their university, they return to a place that's little changed. They change, but they go back to a university steeped in tradition that doesn't change so much. But I hope that when Harris alums come back, they found that they return to a school that has changed. That they have changed and their school has changed. They help make their, the traditions. They are our history. They don't return to a tradition, they make it. Um, so um, for that, we are grateful as well. They go in our, our grateful journal. Um, okay, well, I had to put this up, right? <laughs> um, so um, it's not self-congratulatory, but um, rather to acknowledge that um, we were all part of the history. I don't know, maybe, maybe we didn't always deserve the winner trophy, but we deserved the participation trophy. We tried hard. <laughs> so um, we cared, we tried, and we are part of the history too. Um, and I want to make a special thanks to Bob. Um, this is a quote. Um, the Harris School asks the hard questions. Is it important? Will it make a difference? What effect will it have? Because our answers go out into the real world to affect change. Um, Bob was dean for 40% of the time the school's been the school. He was the dean that dealed with all the minutia of making a school from nothing to something. And thank you, Bob. <laughs> and there's Daniel, our future. <laughs> we wish you the best. Um, uh, we hope to put you in our gratitude journal someday, too. <laughs> um, so now I've saved, though, for the last, uh, the group that gets top billing in the Gratitude Journal. Um, each of these people has made an exceptional gift to the school, and each has made important non-financial contributions as well. Many others, many, many others have also made important financial and non-financial gifts to the school. Um, but these are... Um, a crucially important part of the history of the school and get top billing in the, um, in the gratitude journal, except this is the real top bill. Thank you.